she's a geek nerd in Swedish. She's a manager of geeks and she's a chief technology officer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a true honor. Please welcome Mary Williams. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear, everybody hear me okay? Excellent. So, as she said, I'm South African, which has one very bad side effect that sometimes I speak too quickly. So I need everybody's help. You're going to practice right now. If I start speaking far too quickly, you have to do this. Do it now. Prove me. There you go. Thank you. <clears throat> so yeah, these days I'm a chief technology officer for a company called Moo, or a design and uh, technology company that happened to print things. Uh, any really cool business card you've ever been given is probably a Moo card. Um, but I started off as a, as a hardware geek um, back in South Africa. Um, my minor claim to fame is I built part of, part of South Africa's first satellite when I was a, a teenager. So something I sold that is in space, um, which is kind of weird. Uh, who of your parents? Okay, I, I'm not a parent yet, but I have advice for you. Don't let them do anything cool when they're young. Like, something I sold to Winter Space when I was 15, it has all been fucking downhill since then. Like, I can never be that cool again, right? Um, but I, I've worked in lots of, lots of different places. I've Procter & Gamble, which is a massive consumer goods company in the US uh, for many years. And then I have, I have one year of proper public service. I, I left um, P&G and I joined the UK government um, and helped scale up the, the government digital service. Who, if any of you are in um, the more digital side of things, you might have heard of, uh, of GovUK and the, and the work we did there. I think the thing I'm best remembered for at GovUK is making that cake which is, was literally like this big um, in, the, in the shape of the logo. Um, but this talk is, if my slides will work. I made a Jew, there we go. But because I was a geek and I started out basically finding computers fascinating and people terrifying, uh, when I first got asked to become a manager, this was my reaction. It was, it was pretty terrifying, um, and I'd had a lot of bad being managed experiences. Um, and I think we, we all hate bad bosses, right? We think they're described as clueless or as empty suits or pointless. I think everybody's familiar with the seagull style of management. Fly in, shout at everybody, shit on everything, fly away again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's new to some of you, but you're going to use it in your office next week. <laughs> you, you, you're going to talk about it. Um, and so, so I, was, I was pretty terrified that I was going to be terrible at this when I, when I got asked to start managing people. Uh, it wasn't helped by the fact that my first two direct reports were older than my dad. Um, and I could imagine his reaction to having someone my age become his line manager. Uh, and so it was just a bundle of fear. Um, and so, but my, my reaction was fairly defiant. I, I refused to be bad at it. This is the best cat gif on the internet after extensive research, I can confirm. Um, and so I decided to, that I just refused to be bad at this and did what, what you know, geeks typically do, which is to, to go find knowledge and go find uh, understanding about how to, how to do something well. Um, I love this description from Katarina Fake, who's very famous in, in my industry as a, a founder of a couple of really amazing tech companies, that there's, there's three kind of managers. You can be the, the bullshit umbrella, protect your people. You can be the bullshit funnel, you pick the person you hate the most and you concentrate it all onto them. Um, or the bullshit fan, you just spread it all around indiscriminately. Um, and it, and I think that at the bare minimum, we have to be great bullshit umbrellas. Um, but the other thing I found when I, went, when I went looking, and I'm a computer scientist, so we're pretty skeptical about management science. We think that's a little bit of an oxymoron. Um, but I went and found, like, actually, there's proper research and proper science and stuff. And the, the worst thing that the tech industry in particular does is we act like we have to start with 1920s style factory management and, like, figure it out from there. Like, we'll ignore the last hundred years of, uh, of research and evolution and, and people getting a lot better at this and, and buy into these kind of this management wisdom stuff, which is actually very outdated and, and not very scientific at all. Um, and so once I'd accepted that lots of the things I was being told were the way to do it, were just not, um, and that there were, that, but there was good research and there were, there were better ways, um, and in particular that just being super directional was probably not the right thing to do, um, I, went, I went looking for science. And uh, because I'm a nerd, I have a favorite management book, um, and you can all judge me for that if you want to, but it's, it's this one. Has anybody read First Break All the Rules? 
Anybody seen it before? Okay. The thing I love about it is that it's really, really, really data-based. So Gallup did a hundreds of thousands of people study. Um, they weren't looking for what made teams high-performing. They weren't. They didn't go looking for what made people happy. They just went looking for what what makes this restaurant perform better than the others in the chain? Why has this factory got such a better safety record? Why is this division so much more profitable than the others in the company? Um, so they, in articulating what made teams the best performing, they found a whole bunch of things that predicted high performance. And these, predic these predictions of high performance come into these uh, 12 questions. Anybody who is like desperately trying to take a photo, I will post the slides later. You're very welcome to take a photo, but I will also post the slides on Twitter in a bit. Um, and uh, again, my reaction to that is kind of like, oh, great. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I'm drowning in 12 things to remember. That's not going to happen. So if we zoom out a little bit from those 12 questions and look a little bit first at what um, what really makes up motivation? Has anybody read Drive? Yeah, a few of you. Those of you who don't have time to read a book about it, there's a wonderful 15-minute long sketch note. that you. So it's a, a talk with somebody drawing um, the key messages that, again, I'll, I'll post in a little bit that's, that's very worth um, reading. So Dan Pink went looking at what the latest uh, research in psychology said about what what motivated people? What makes you want to get up in the morning and be happy about going to work rather than um, kind of have the Monday morning blues or, or similar? And f basically figured out that it's the motivation is a combination of purpose, believing in what you're doing. Like why, why are you here? Why, why is your organization doing what it's doing? Autonomy, getting a say in what, feeling like you're listened to, but you get to set some of the direction. And mastery, being proud of how and then taking away any negative factors that detract. You can have the most inspiring um, purpose, get listened to plenty and be brilliant at what you do, but if you've got a seven hour a day commute, you're probably not gonna be too happy about it. And so those 12 questions from the beginning actually fit very well into that framework. So, you know, purpose, does the mission or purpose of my company make me feel like my work is important? And in the last kind of 15 years, I've probably had Oh, the maths is scary. 1,300-odd uh, different people in the organizations I've been leading. And one thing that's really fascinating to me when I, when I meet somebody new is whether they're inspired by the big, big picture purpose. You know, they, they're not happy unless they're helping save lives or change the world, or whether they're inspired by the little picture purpose. Like, does what they're doing today help the people around them or help drive towards the, the rest? And it's useful to find out about yourself whether you're a, you got, you, you got to be saving the world, otherwise you're not going to be happy kind of person, or whether you just need to feel connected to the, to the broader picture. Autonomy, do I know what's expected of me at work, and do my opinions seem to count? Which are another two of those 12 questions. And I find it fascinating how much is about mastery. Do I have what I need to do my work? Do I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day? Um, does somebody at work care about my development? The people around me care about quality work. Being surrounded by people who care less than you is really demotivating. Um, in the last six months, somebody talked about my development. And do I have opportunities to learn and grow? And I think instinctively, we all know that those things are important, but seeing just how many of them are all about people needing to feel proud of how they are working um, is really interesting. But there's a few things missing in, in terms of those 12 questions that predict high performance. So in the last seven days, have I received recognition or praise for good work? Does my supervisor or somebody at work seem to care about me as a person, not as a resource? If anybody calls you a resource, you get to call them overhead. <laughs> Any engineers definitely do that. We don't like being called resources. And I love this last question because it's, it's like a, a, a cultural differences 101 course all in itself. So do I have a best friend at work is a question that in America everybody understands and is fine with being asked. In Britain, if you say, do you have a best friend at work, you get this bristling reaction that the company doesn't get to choose who your one true best friend is selected from. It's... Um, so they really don't like that question, and so I have to reinterpret it in the UK and be like, is there someone at work who, without being forced or somebody else paying for the beer, you would choose to, to, to spend time with and not complain about it the next day? <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is the definition of best friend at work in the UK, uh, <laughs> in the UK context. I, I'm, I, I found myself over in Sweden quite a lot recently. I'm still not really sure how to phrase it. And so anybody who's got suggestions for how we would ask that question to a, um, to a Swedish team, I'd really love to, to understand. Um, 
so South Africa has a more American interpretation of it again as well. And the Dutch, you wouldn't ask that question. And those are the main cultures I've had lots of exposure to. And so I summarize this as, you know, do I, do I feel rewarded and respected? Can I be myself and be successful? I call it inclusion. Um, and I think those four things together are, are what you need to create in an environment for people to feel that they can be the best that they can be. Um, you know, they, they, need to, they need purpose, believing in why, autonomy, get a say in what, mastery, be proud of how, inclusion, feel like they belong. I feel like you belong, but not that everybody is just like you is probably one of the hardest challenges we have as, as leaders in terms of creating space where people can be great. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about purpose, autonomy, and mastery, but then I'm going to do a lot more about, uh, about diversity and inclusion um, towards the end of the talk. There we go. And so our mission as leaders is to create that space. I, I think there's a, I suppose, a fundamental philosophy I have, which is I don't think anybody gets up in the morning and says, today I'm aiming for just south of mediocre. <laughs> and if I can screw up everybody else along the way, then that will make my day perfect. Like nobody does, the, the occasional sociopath does exist. I will grant you, get them out of your team. Um, but almost everybody wants to be great at what they do, right? There are people who have accepted that they hate their job, but there's nobody who wants to hate their job. There's nobody who gets up in the morning and wants to be terrible. Everybody wants to be great at what they do. Everybody wants to feel like they're making a difference and that, that, that their work is worthwhile. It's such a big part of our lives. It's so much of how we spend our time. And so if our job is not to tell everybody what to do, but just to create the environment in which they can be brilliant and then get the hell out of their way and make sure they've got the right support, that's a much more fun job as a leader as well. And so ask yourself, do your people know why they're doing what they're doing? Do they get a say in what? Are they doing the right thing? And are they doing the thing right? And then do we do a good job of making everybody feel like they, they belong? And anybody who really wants the photo, that's the one to take a photo of. So the, these 12 questions all together are, are um, in, but it's, the 12 questions are great, but it's a lot easier to remember the four areas, purpose, autonomy, mastery, and inclusion. So what does this actually mean? Like practically, what do you go do differently? Um, I think number one is part of our role as leaders and managers is to be a translator for our people. We've often got more context. Um, sometimes we've got more, more experience, sometimes we've just got more information. But helping people see how the work they're doing fits into the broader whole is something that you have to remember week by week is, is part of your role and part of what you need to be doing. Um, almost always when something happens where a team went off and did something completely weird, I blame myself for not making sure that the translation happened properly rather than blaming the team for, being, for doing a strange thing. So it's almost always a, a problem with communication or, or translation of purpose. Um, enable people's autonomy and mastery. Um, you, you can pay a lot of money to go on a situational leadership course, which is what the posh corporate term for this is, but I, I call it a clue skills matrix. Um, on a given task, people or a given initiative, people are in one of these grids. They, they may not know what they're doing or how to do it, in which case they need teaching. Um, they might know exactly what to do and be equipped to do it, in which case your role as a manager is probably to be a bulldozer and a cheerleader. Get stuff out of their way, tell them they're awesome. Um, it's much more likely that people are in one of the other quadrants though, right? They, they know what they're trying to do, but they lack the skills or the knowledge to, to do it completely independently. Or they've got all the skills and knowledge, but they're struggling to figure out what the right plan is. Um, and that's why developing coaching skills and, and helping pair them up with people who are more experienced with them is, is very useful. Um, and so think about those different hats that you can wear as a, as a manager and that your managers should be wearing with their teams um, in terms of how to make sure that they're, they're getting the right kind of help and support and direction at the right time. Very junior managers tend to be very black and white and only do one of those things. They leave people completely alone, <laughs> assuming that they know what to do and how to do it or they're overly directive. And you'll see the same manager doing those two different things with two different people and helping them find the shades of gray in the, in the middle of this person, they've got a lot of knowledge and they've, they've got a lot of skills, but they just need help figuring out how best to apply it. Or they know exactly what we need to do, but they need some more, some more skills or training before they're gonna be able to do it on their own. And remember that we're, we're good at what we, what we practice, provided that we learn from it. Um, there's this definition of, if anybody's read the 10,000 hour rule stuff, or there's a book called Talent is Overrated, which is very, a very good summary of the, the research and science in this area, that 
deliberate practice is a particular type of practice where you have to be, you know, you're motivated, you want to do it, you are willing to exert effort in order to improve your performance, you take into account what you already know and it builds on it, you get immediate informative feedback, and you repeatedly perform the same or similar tasks. And when we think about how we structure schooling for young children, we're very good at structuring early learning in this way. Um, when you learn to write, you get to practice it a lot, do it over and over. Um, when you learn a new skill in, in high school, it's often structured in this way. Um, when I learned about this model and had the sudden realization that none of my actual professional work had ever been structured in a way that was helpful for me to learn from it, it was a real light bulb moment for me personally. Um, and so th think about ways that you can help design the actual day-to-day -day work for people in ways that it becomes deliberate practice. How, have people got enough, is it challenging enough to be interesting, but not so challenging to be frustrating? Enough repetition that they can learn without being so repetitive that, that, that it's boring? And then um, are they getting a good feedback loop so that they can, they can learn from it? Make sure that's the case for you as well as, as leaders and managers. And then cultivate inclusion. The best predictor of whether we can attract, recruit, retain um, really great talent is whether we can whether people agree with the statement that somebody like them can be successful here. Um, it's often the thing that we miss when people that are really talented leave our organizations and they aren't great at articulating. They say things like, I just felt like I didn't fit in here or I just felt unwelcome. Um, and we have to make it so we create, create places in which lots of different kinds of people can be successful. Otherwise, we're gonna have an undiverse team which will underperform, because there's plenty of science to show that diverse teams outperform homogenous teams every single time. So, let's talk about diversity a little bit. Does everyone know what the Daily Mail is? It's this horrible fascist newspaper in the UK. Everything is the fault of like immigrants or Muslims or gays or something like. And so I, I actually have this t-shirt. I, I wear it when I give this talk in the, in the UK. I'm literally the one the Daily Mail warned you about, right? Like, I'm a woman who works in tech. I'm gay, I'm foreign, I'm an immigrant with a job, which I think is worse in the UK than if I were an immigrant without a job, but I have to check the headlines to be sure. Um, I actually have a disability as well, I have no God. Um, and my wife is English, so I'm like, I'm literally over there stealing their women and their jobs, right? <laughs> um, I'm public enemy number one. But I grew up white and apartheid. And so I grew up hugely aware of unasked, undeserved privilege. I grew up in a country where my, my childhood was, oh, the clicker is still not happy with me, there we go. My childhood was full of signs like these. That's a toilet with a sign that says whites only on it. And a beach with a sign that says whites only on it. Through the simple accident of having been born this color, I was able to be in a schooling system that would let me get to the point of going to university. I was still a girl, and so my chances of university were not great, but I had that opportunity. The schooling system during apartheid was designed so that if you were not white, you would never get to university. You would never even finish high school. And if you were black, in particular, and there was various different uh, systems that they, they had set up, but if you were black, you were literally educated to the point of being able to read instructions, and that was it. Most, most children weren't allowed to stay in school beyond the age of 13. Um, so in terms of like massive, systematic, horribly unfair prejudice, that's, that's the environment I grew up in. Um, and denying that privilege is not helpful. Assessing and understanding how that helped me, whether I wanted it to or not, and then trying to make that different for other people is the most useful thing that I can do. If anybody hasn't read Unpacking the, the White Privilege Knapsack, I strongly recommend that, that you read it. It's a really interesting and um, insightful look at all the things we don't realize are benefiting us, um, all the things that don't even cross our minds. Um, one of the problems we have in technology is people tend to say, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, which is a really weird thing to say anyway. But they mean that, no, that it's a meritocracy. Nobody knows who you are or what color or creed or background you are. And so you're, you know, you're free to just be judged on your work. And it's absolute bullshit. 
but it's a bullshit that's very comforting for some people. Um, and so we have to not let people say, well, it's all about merit. We have to recognize that the starting position is different depending on the accidents of our birth and that the systems are still set up in a way that it isn't equal for everybody. Equality is not about treating everybody the same. Equality is about making sure that the same opportunity is open to all. And for somebody who starts very much further back than the starting line that everybody else is on, that means different difference in treatment. I was at school with girls who were, it was a no girls school, which is kind of weird, um, but I, I was at school where there were girls in my class who their grades were worse in winter time because their families couldn't afford candles and they lived in shacks in the township that did not have electricity. And so they were great at school in the summertime when the days were long enough for them to, for, to do work. Did those of us who had electricity in our homes realize that we had an, a major advantage? We thought having the lights on at night was a pretty basic thing. We didn't realize it was a privilege we were experiencing. And so not discriminating is important. And you know, frankly, you're in a country where there, you're a lot better at the laws around this than, than a lot of the rest of the world, legally, if nothing else. But oh, there we go. But tolerance is a terrible word. Who wants to be tolerated? My little brother kind of hates me, but he tolerates me because we're family. <laughs> like, I don't think anybody goes to work and wants somebody to be putting up with you being there, which is what tolerance means. A fully inclusive environment is better for everybody. And so if we think about diversity and inclusion as a spectrum, and on the one end we've got that active-ism. One, one of my first... Uh, one of the reasons I was terrified about being a manager was my, one of my first managers in his first ever one-to-one -one with me, his opening sentence was, I'm surprised you're so open about being gay. I'd expect you to be more ashamed. <laughs> first sentence, new manager. Yeah, you can imagine we had a wonderful trusting relationship from then on out, right? Um, all the way through to like indifference or tolerance or active inclusion. Does everybody know what a microaggression is? A microaggression is, um, telling young boys that they're very smart and telling young girls that they're very pretty. Telling little girls that we care how they look and little boys how we care how they think. Um, a microaggression is also telling somebody who just, who, who you've inferred doesn't look like everybody else around that, they're, that they're, um, their English is very good or their Swedish is very good. Uh, I find it hilarious when people find out I'm foreign and then tell me my English is very good. It's the language I was, it's my mother tongue. It's the language I grew up speaking. I was born speak. I, well, I wasn't born speaking. I'm not like a child prodigy or anything. But like, I grew. You know, it's it's the first language I spoke. So it's extra insulting when somebody's like, "Oh, your English is really good." <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure you have the same thing here, right? Someone who's born here, lived here all their life, but somebody decides to compliment them on their Swedish, um, assuming that they've that they've moved from somewhere else. A microaggression is a really subtle way of telling somebody you're different and you're not welcome here. And we've got to watch out for them because they're just as damaging as, as the big things because they happen so often and they're so pernicious. They're so death by a thousand cuts. So how do we... So the, this is the end of the really depressing bit, I promise. It gets better from here. Um, so how do we make it better? We stop allowing underprivileged groups to to be pushed away when we start building actively inclusive environments. I make it sound really simple. I know it's really hard. Um, so here are some things that work. And I've been in, as I said, lots of different environments um, and done lots of different things around this topic. Um, at PNG, we used to have a very uh, low proportion of our um, IT hires, were, um, our technology hires were, were women, and we moved that to being 50-50 over the course of three years. Um, built much more um, inclusive teams in other organizations. And I run a technology conference now, it's called the Lead Developer, where we consistently have like a fully representative lineup. So there's um, as many uh, women on stage as men, there's LGBT representation, there's um, people of color. Um, so I know exactly how hard this is, but these are some practical things that genuinely make a difference. So first up, reduce fear. Adding opportunity without reducing fear is, is kind of fixing half the problem. Um, when you want to promote someone, but they know that they're going to be under much more scrutiny than other people, not providing the extra support is, is not helping them be able to actually take that opportunity. At PNG, at one point, we had a problem where a number of women said no to promotions because they um, didn't think that they could handle the pressure of being one of the only women at that new level. 
Um, and so we had people who were talented and ready to, to perform at the next level who said no because we weren't supporting them well enough. Um, and we had some who said yes and then weren't supported well enough and found it really hard. So you've got you to gotta look at not only whether there's equality of opportunity, but whether it's really equal, whether it's just as easy for them to, to succeed as somebody else. Educate yourself and others about privilege and implicit bias. There's a great um, bit of work that uh, Harvard Business School have done on this. In terms of what, like, what does privilege even mean? The, the easiest analogy I've found is this one by a guy called John Scalzi. Um, but it's like, it's the difficulty setting of the game of life. Right? Um, you, you may not realize if you're playing on easy or playing on hard. That's the thing to try and figure out. Um, it's a great article if, you've, uh, if you want to read more about this. Um, and Im implicit bias is about the, the times when we're not actively discriminating, but passively when we don't realize the, the impact that we're having. There's a famous case of an orchestra in the US where everybody on the selection board for the orchestra was desperate to have better gender representation. And even though they all cared and they got more, more women on the, on the selection committee and they got more women auditioning, they continued to only select 10 to 15% um, of the players. And they brought, I think, somebody from the university in to, to help, figure, help them figure out whether there was something wrong with their process, that it was still not happening. Because um, they continued to believe they just couldn't find good enough musicians and that they, were, you know, they couldn't drop the bar for because um, uh, it, would, it would damage the orchestra. And they came in and they put a screen up in front of the, the player. And when they could only hear the music, they selected 50-50. Because there were so few women who were world-class soloists in, in international orchestras, that, they, that something looked wrong when they saw someone play. So even a set of people who were genuinely trying and genuinely committed continued to, to passively discriminate, even though they, they were trying so hard to make it better. I haven't figured out how we do job interviews behind a screen in a way that we can't tell or can't see someone. Um, but if anybody cracks that, drop me an email, because I'd, I'd love to know. There's actually some tech companies who started doing their first interview over, um, over instant message, um, like over, which I think is half, half a millennial adaptation and half a, a way of trying to be more unaware of um, someone's characteristics. Um, nah, it's just really not working now. Any luck? Oh, there we go. XKCD is like a fantastic cartoon. W one of the things to remember is that part of that fear piece, part of that bias piece is people know that they get judged more if they're the only one of their kind that you see. Um, if, if you're representing a, a new type of person that somebody hasn't worked with before, then you feel like you're, you're representing everybody like you um, all the time. And that adds a lot of pressure as well. And check the signals that you send. Logistics matter. Um, you know, if you, if you run any community stuff, but it's all in the evening and that hurts people's ability to attend because they've got caring responsibilities or, or whatever. Um, people can't judge your intent. Um, and language matters. What's the default you're assuming? I cringe every time I see a uh, tech job description that, that assumes that it's going to be a guy that applies. I'm like, and then, and then those companies hire me to help them with their diversity problem. I'm like, come on, guys. You don't have to pay anybody to realize why you've got a diversity problem. <laughs> um, check if systems are loaded. Uh, one of my colleagues at PNG at one point did a whole um, uh, dissertation on PNG doesn't have a pitch for a pay rise process. You know, it has the forced curve and, and all those kind of things. But the pay rise is pretty much figured out automatically based on uh, what, the, what the performance outcome was. Um, and it had a much smaller gender pay gap than other similar companies. Um, and so there's an interpretation of that, which is um, if, if, if your process is that you have to go tell your boss how amazing you are and that you deserve more money every year, that's going to... Um, that tends to favor people from individualistic cultures, so from the West, um, and, and frankly, favors men. Um, so think about whether your actual systems and the way they're set up are inherently helping certain people and disadvantaging others. And, you know, frankly, shy or humble guys suffer in that situation too. They're not any good at pitching for a pay rise either. 
And remember that when we give advice, it has to be advice people can take. There's, uh, oh, it's really, really not working. There we go. Um, there's a lot of advice people get, which basically reads like, be, like, be more like a straight, cis, American, white guy. So you know the term cis? Um, cis is when you're, uh, you happen to be born in the body you feel you belong in, rather than being transgender or tran transsexual. Um, and so if you have someone that you mentor or you coach or who works for you, who you think you keep telling them how to get better, you keep giving them great advice, and they keep not taking it, maybe you're giving them advice that they just can't be true to themselves and, and able to do it. Um, you get a lot of women who are told they just need to be, they need to stand up more and they need to be louder in meetings and they need to put themselves forward more. And when women do that, they're told that they're too abrasive and too direct and all these kind of things. Because it's, it's not bad advice, it's just advice that they can't successfully take. And when we get advice that we can't take, we have one of two reactions. We either run away or we front up. This one is my like patron saint. Um, <laughs> and so it makes you either go, like, screw you, or peace out, I'm gone. Look for that reaction in people that you're trying to help. Look for that reaction in yourself. It's a really good indication that you're being given advice or guidance that you feel like you can't, you can't be true to yourself and take that advice at the same time. Give guidance, frame guidance altruistically. Baking more pie goes a lot better than stealing more pie. And do you really want the people who want to climb over the dead bodies of their colleagues to succeed anyway? I mean, I think the investment banking world has that covered. Um, and one of the really specific ways that I saw this be different was when we ran the internship program at Proctor um, for our IT interns. We used to have this guy who was, he was very slick and he was very salesy and he'd be like, talk to everybody that you, like, talk to everybody that you can in your first few weeks here because you never know how they might be useful to you. And the next year, and it was a company where being able to find people who knew stuff was really important. A lot of people stayed there a long time, a lot of knowledge was in people's heads. And so we, uh, we reframed it as, talk to everybody you can in your 10 weeks, you're going to become an expert in the thing you're working on. You never know how you might be able to help them. And that year we saw a complete flip in how broad the set of interns that really succeeded was. It made a massive, massive difference. And it was half an hour in their first week that we changed how we were giving them some advice. It was really fascinating. And then remember to value the what over the how. Part of giving people coaching or advice that they can't take is what you're telling them what to do and how to do it. If you tell them what they need to achieve and then help them figure out how they would achieve that, it tends to go a lot better. So if you've ever done any coaching courses or, um, or similar, that, that's what those techniques are about. They're helping you to, some, somebody who you know they've got knowledge and understanding and they just need guidance on how to find the right path. Um, it's a lot easier to get them to, to the right path by, by saying, well, what are we trying to achieve and what are the different routes that you could take there? Um, and remember that people perform better when they can be themselves. Stonewall, who is the leading LGBT rights organization in, in the UK, did this piece of research a few years ago that said when people feel like they can be open about who they are, they're 40% more effective at work. Because all that energy that's wrapped up in hiding who they are, never mentioning the gender pronoun of their, uh, of their partner or not really talking about their whole life because they, they feel like they're going to be judged for it. All that energy could be going into the work if they were able to be themselves and be happier. So this is a, you know, there's lots of reasons to do this because it's right. There's also lots of reasons to do this because it's going to make the, the team as a whole more effective. And remember that role modeling matters. I used to think this was bullshit. I, I came up through computer science. My university course was... 90% guys, I'd never seen women who did what I did all the way through, through uni and frankly most of the way through my early career as well. Um, but then when I ran recruitment for p and for tech, when we took a woman and they presented at, uh, at the college campus or at the events, 100% more women applied than when there was nobody like them visible. And so when, when people are going, can I, can I be myself and be successful here? They are looking for whether there's people like them further up the chain. And they're also, if there isn't somebody just like them, they're just looking for, are there different people here? Are there people I can say, well, I don't have to be a carbon copy. There's some variety further up than me. One of the most 
interesting insights we had from that internship program was that we we'd do a role modeling session in the middle of it with a really senior manager and one of these like second year uni students would pluck up the courage to say, well, did you always know you were going to be this senior? And the men always said, yeah, you know, I, at every stage I believed in myself and I backed my own plays and I, and I got there. And universally the women said, no. And sometimes I was terrified. And sometimes I trusted my mentors when they told me I was ready when I didn't feel ready. And that made me go and tell people who I believed in that I believed in them and why. The first person I did that to burst into tears because she thought the whole time when people told her she was great, because they never gave any specifics, that she was about to be found out, that she wasn't really that great. They were going to see through her. Imposter syndrome, right? And I was the first person who'd ever sat her down and said, this is why you're brilliant. These are the things you do that are so impressive, and I think you're going to go far. Um, and it's probably the insight that's made me change how I interact with people the most over the last few years is realizing how much it, how it can change other people's careers just for them to know that you have confidence in them and that you believe they have potential and that you've actually said that out loud. So that most important question, someone like me can be successful here, is the thing to remember for yourself and for others. And when we craft inclusive environments, there's actually three questions people are asking whether they realize it or not. Am I expected here? Am I respected here? Can I be myself and be successful here? And that first one is really interesting. If you have a website or an office or an interview process where somebody doesn't encounter anybody who's any different from everybody else and they are different, they're not going to feel like they're expected. If they, are, if they get asked interview questions that are inappropriate or treated with disrespect during the interview, then they're not going to feel respected. And if there's just no evidence that anybody, that they could be who they are and, and succeed, then they're going to choose to go somewhere else and you're going to lose out. I'm, I think I'm over time, so I'm not going to... Uh, I'm okay? Okay. Um, so in summary, assume fear, understand risk, and help with it. Advise people to bake more pie, not steal more pie. We don't want assholes anyway. Um, educate yourself and others about privilege and implicit bias. Connect people to role models. Grow more role models. Encourage them to be visible, but don't put all of the onus of um, being visible on that one woman in technology that you managed to hire, because she won't stay if she has to do all that extra work, <laughs> um, and nobody else is helping carry the load. Um, I know many of my examples are for technology, but I'm sure that they're, I, I know that they're analogous for other areas. Remember people are asking, can someone like me be successful here? Remember that you're asking that yourself. Have a honest look at whether you feel that that's true in your current organization. And if it's not, then you can either choose to go somewhere where it is, or you can choose to stay and make your current place somewhere where that's true. Um, and don't underestimate the, the extent to which you can change it if you, if you stay. Tell people that you believe in that they can, and tell them that they're there because of their skills. I am admittedly the one the Daily Mail warned you about, that the director who most lost my respect was the one who was like, you can't leave my organization, you tick all the diversity check boxes. I need, you, I need you here so nobody gives me shit about not having a diverse enough team. Cool. Bye. Uh, <laughs> um, and then help people find ways to be true to themselves and successful and make sure that you look at your systems and processes as well. Space to be awesome is about these four things. Purpose, helping people understand why we're doing what we're doing and how their work fits into it. Autonomy, getting a say in what. Mastery, being proud of how. And then inclusion, feeling like you can belong, feeling like different people can be themselves and be successful. Every role is capable of virtuosity. Everybody can be brilliant. And our job as, as leaders and as managers is to, to help an ecosystem exist in which that's possible for all different kinds of people. We don't have to take each individual and force them to be amazing. We just have to create the space in which that can happen. So that's my key message. Go make space to be awesome, to be inclusive. If you don't find it, create it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, one question. That one was cute. The hedgehog of a win. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we as managers have a huge responsibility mm -hmm. in helping people be the most, the best they can be. And you, you talked about checking signals. Mm -hmm. That's kind of difficult. Probably I'm not aware of what kind of signals I'm sending. Yeah. And, uh, but I, th I think there's two things. That there's developing the trust with your team that they'll tell you. 
Um, and there's also, you know, you can do this in, um, in tech, we talk about like user stories, like as this kind of person, I want to achieve this thing so that I can do that. And you can, you can do that. You can say, imagine a persona that's as different from what we have in our team today as possible. How would they experience seeing our careers website for the first time, coming for an interview at this office for the first time? Um, what, what are those things that we're doing? And the other, you know, you can, you can look at it in a bit more detail, but the other signal you're already all being sent is who is joining your organization and who is leaving your organization. And who are the candidates who look amazing when you're trying to hire them, who say no even to a good offer? Who are the people that choose not to join you um, even, even though you really want them? Um, and I think that's one of the, th that's the kind of, that tends to be the signal that gets people worried. Um, and then the other signal that gets people worried is people that they think of as really talented um, leaving for reasons that don't seem that good a reason. Um, people who are great, who could have stayed and they could have moved up and been promoted in, in future, moving to a role somewhere else that doesn't seem like it's as good is the other signal that you can watch for. And then when you realize the problem, then you dig a bit more into what's the specific stuff that you're doing. And I like your advice here, be awesome. <laughs> as managers, we need to be awesome yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Create space to be the best you can be as well. Thank cool. you so much for coming. Mary Williams. Williams.